Hello, Trailblazers, and welcome to yet another episode of Entrepreneur Journey. And today I am delighted to have uh, a friend of mine that I met months ago, uh, Chuck DeBroder. Hi, Chuck. How are you? Hey, Doug. Uh, first off, I'm honored to be here. I see your little podcast interviews pop up on my feed all the time, and I listen where I can, and I've learned some golden nuggets as we've uh, it was the lingo of our last group there, but I've learned some things, and you can learn from other people's life stories, so I love podcasts. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the whole reason I, I started this podcast is because Everybody goes through different things as entrepreneurs, and, and sometimes some people go through something that you have yet to go through, and it's helpful knowing their experience before they ever went through it, uh, before you ever go through it, rather. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I've been fascinated with entrepreneur stories since I was a little, a little person. <laughs> well, I'll give you a little hint, and it'll date me a little bit as well. I got unlimited power on cassette tape from Tony Robbins. And I learned a lot of what I learned about motivating my own life from that back. Uh, gosh, I might have got that. She's right in my first year of college out of high school. But um, I think one tape is even destroyed or missing from it. But the things I learned from that were just guided me through the rest of my successes in life. You know? Yeah. I, I think I might even had the same. We might, I don't know how our age difference, but I might've had something similar. It, it's like had the four cassettes in, in the, in the plastic case and you open it, uh -huh. it kind of looked like a book, but you opened it up and there were four cassettes. Exactly. And, and Nightingale Conant was mm -hmm. the motivational company. And I've got Brian Tracy's original stuff. I've got all kinds of uh, interesting things that I learned a lot from. So we can always learn from other stories. And I think the best ones are the ones that are real. Yep. I, I, I totally agree. So tell us a little bit about you. Well, I'm pretty real. I was, uh, <laughs> let's see, I was born on a cold winter day in Colorado, uh, January 17th. I, I'm originally from Denver and I love weather. And you have to love weather in Colorado because you can't see it, especially if we lived near the mountains, near the foothills. You can't see it until it's on top of you. Mm. And then I had a mom that watched every news channel, every weather cast, and she had her favorites. And so it stuck in my subconscious. I, I was a performer and I have my German grandma to thank who encouraged me. And I would sing and dance. And, you know, I was a talking animal since I was born. <laughs> Uh, so in kindergarten, the teacher discovered my talent for talking, usually at the wrong time. So she put me in an <laughs> empty classroom and gave me one of those Fisher Price kind of microphone pretend. And she says, uh, kind of like a karaoke thing. She said, Chuck, pretend you're on the radio. I said, hey, how cool, because my dad listened to the radio all the time, talk radio. So I went into the room. She came back over an hour later and I was still talking, pretending I was on the radio. <laughs> wow. And she, she knew I was destined for a career. And so I got into uh, my first degree is in broadcasting and public relations. And um, I did broadcasting. And even back then, it was minimum wage to start off in radio. Mm. And I thought, gee, you can't pay rent. You can't pay the bills on this. And I did weekend news talk sports. And I did college news director and I did uh, some things like that. And I did voiceover work. And then I didn't, you know, want to say whatever. So I went into the public relations side, got a paid internship at Adolph Coors Company in Golden, Colorado at the world headquarters at the time. It has uh, since moved to Chicago, but the, still the world's largest single site brewery is still there in Golden, Colorado. And uh, I had been a tour guide for um, about five summers before. Toughest college job. You got eight cases or two kegs of beer a month for half price. <laughs> there were five women tour guides to every guy. Wow. And I got to give eight tours of the brewery a, a day. And then I got to give 
the next day tours of the city of Golden, next day park cars. And it was a different job each day. So it was cool. But then in PR, it was not when and how to release the truth. It was when and how much of a severe modification <laughs> of the truth you uh, would have to say. So I said, you know what? I've always wanted to go into weather. Um, and I researched Metropolitan State University in downtown Denver. And they had a meteorology program. So I told mom and dad, hey, after I graduate, I want to go into a second degree in meteorology which was quite a shocker because you've got to go through calculus three, physics three, wow. statistics, a course that incorporates all those courses and weather. And um, those of us that are creative are a little more challenged discipline wise when it comes to math. So a few of my former college math tutors, I think are still in the Colorado State Mental Hospital <laughs> because I put them there. But um, yeah. So anyway, I went into TV weather and I drove around and my three keys to success are practice, persistence, and enthusiasm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I give a whole speech on that, but I would record the weather guy stand in front of, of on the side of the TV and I love when the weather guy went out on a live shot because he wasn't in front of the map. And I acted like I did the weather every night from my living room in Pueblo, Colorado, then in Denver, then in Lubbock, Texas. Because a news director in Lubbock, after 26 TV stations, told me no. And I did what I learned from Tony Robbins. I, I asked the people, why are you saying no? what would bring me to a yes? And I wrote it down as a key to success. And then I would implement that in my next audition. You know, I blew up a 1980 Buick Skylark limited <laughs> edition. It was limited because it had a four cylinder engine in a two ton car and they had to turn the engine sideways with shock absorbers on the engine because the engine would lurch forward trying to get the car to move. But anyway, oh it was bad American engineering back in the 1980s, but I melted the engine on that, um, looking for a job. I finally got a maybe in Lubbock, and I had been a Chili's waiter while I was going to meteorology school. So um, the news director, when I moved there, said, oh, Chuck, uh, this is my last day at the TV station. I'm going to be doing PR at the Lubbock Independent School District. So good luck. So... <laughs> My girlfriend had moved there and she was going to be a nurse. So we had a place to live and at least rent. So I went to the Chili's there. They took me in and I worked there until the new news director at the same station finally hired me. But they paid me $8 an hour to do TV weather with two college degrees in Lubbock, Texas. Wow. And this was 27 years ago. Wow. Wow. Um, and so, uh, the general manager was a good old boy and it's like, Chuck, if you don't lock that $8 an hour, we've got 10,000 college students here at Texas tech that would love to be on TV, uh, there. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I worked at wow. Chili's and, and people would say, Hey Chuck, I love your weather. What are you doing here? I'm like, how do you like your fajitas? <laughs> I, I got to pay two college degrees. I got to pay my rent, you know? So yeah. th that's my weather story. Yeah. I would and, never have, Oh, sorry. Oh, I, go I, ahead. I would have never have thought that um, weather didn't pay as well. I, I thought weather paid well. <laughs> and it's gone back down there. If you could wow. believe right now, because there's nobody watching local news, mm. but I did get offered uh, $36,000 a year, which was more than Chili's and more than what I was making at the TV station in, in Lubbock, to move to El Paso, Texas, mm. to be what I thought was the weekend weather person. Now, they neglected to say they only had one weather guy working for a couple months, and I was going to have to play the part three days a week of a morning show meteorologist and then two days a week, Saturdays and Sundays. 
as a weekend. And I would record Sunday night for Monday morning. And then the main guy would record the morning cut-ins for the Today Show and the weather for Tuesday morning. So I my weekend was started at 11 o'clock Sunday night and ended at 9 o'clock on Tuesday night because I had to do Wednesday, Thursday, and mm-hmm. Friday for many months until they finally hired a weekend weather person. TV and entertainment is a whole different animal. And it's... Um, I feel sorry for the kids now graduating with that degree because my old station now says, hey, do you live with your parents? Because if you do, it's a plus for you getting hired because they know they can pay you less because they, you don't have to pay the rent or the bills. So I don't know how these kids are paying off their student loans. But anyway, I lasted 23 years, four months as a TV weatherman at the NBC affiliate, I was told I had seven general managers and 18 news directors, newsroom managers in 23 years. So I don't need to tell any stories that tell everything in one sentence. That's how tumultuous uh, that TV station was. But I lasted through 18, the 18th news director and the seventh GM finally canned me for talking to corporate HR. (laughs) And they were afraid that I was telling what was really was going on down here. So after they canned me over the phone after 23 years, and um, I told corporate HR what was going on. But again, I look back at that time and I wasn't a victim. I developed myself into a brand name. Every general manager would do surveys And they would say, hey, uh, do you know this guy? And it would just be my picture, no name. And people would say, oh, that's Chuck DeBroder. They wouldn't say, oh, that's a weather guy. That's a news guy. No, that's Chuck DeBroder. And I had a 96 to 98% recognition rate. So, and you know how I did that? I did that by being me. You know, I did that by, no one can be you better than you. And every general manager would say, you don't have the look of a weatherman. And I'm like, well, how does a weatherman look? It's only in your mind. And that's my other passion. So I'm a weather geek and I'm still a social media meteorologist. You go to Chuck DeBroder Certified Meteorologist Facebook and get all kinds of worldwide environmental, geological and weather news, as well as borderland forecast for southern New Mexico, far west Texas, and northern Chihuahua, Mexico. Chihuahua. That's where I forecast, <laughs> right here. Nice. Um, and so the last, uh, gosh, going on three years, September 12th, I will be a social media meteorologist. I have Poe Toyota as a sponsor. I have Jerusalem International Foods and Big Media Signs and soon to have a couple other sponsors, but they pay me monthly to have their commercials in my nightly live stream newscast. So I'm doing what I love there. My second passion is the power of the mind. And Tony Robbins got me into that. Tony doesn't really talk about it, but Tony's a hypnotist. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. And he got into the um, motivational field through Bandler and Grinder and the the people who took Milton Erickson's hypnotic language and turned it into neuro-linguistic program, NLP. So Tony opened up an office after he, gosh, I only think he spent one night at their conference. And then I think he even asked for his money back because you could ask for his money back (laughs) because he learned the keys to um, make him an excellent motivator in the first night of the conference. And um, but anyway, he opened up a stop smoking clinic in Canada and helped people to stop smoking. Um, But anyway, um, I got into hypnosis because I watched a stage hypnotist. But then I also was into mentalism, which is form of magic like David Blaine or Darren Brown for people watching in the UK, uh, Chris Angel, you know, all those type of tricks. 
or on America's Got Talent. Now you watch some of the, the people that will um, do tricks that have pre-set up videos on cell phones and all that. So a lot of the mentalists, magicians were also hypnotists. So I started studying with uh, my mentor in uh, Manchester, England. Um, and uh, I didn't go there, but I studied uh, online mainly from Alex William Smith, who uh, goes by jo Jonathan Royal, probably 18 years ago. And then, you know, he's no nonsense. He's like, um, you know, don't spend three years like they do in some of these NLP and hypnosis courses learning this uh, winky wanking BS, he calls it. He talks, you know, uh, in, uh, in Great Britain and he's pretty blunt and he uses some colorful language <laughs> in his training. But, you know, I just started doing it. And that's where I learned to take imperfect action. So for 17 years, I've been helping people help themselves make positive changes in their life. Lose weight, erase anxiety and phobias, erase the past, which is the basis of most challenges in our life. We can only deal with right now and steer our ship where we want to go. If we had a back to the future time machine, uh, a Doctor Who time travel or whatever, um, we could go back and change some things. But most of our challenges are the same 30 to 60 second movie played in a loop over and over again in the, our heads. So if I can make that loop disappear, you feel like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders and all your other challenges don't seem as bad. So during my 17 years as a hypnotist, which I did while I was a, a chief meteorologist at NBC in El Paso, and I tell people in speeches now, I would hypnotize you every night on the weather cast to think I was a more accurate weatherman. So that's why you liked me, because <laughs> I would hypnotize you every night. But I learned in my hypnosis, people would say, hey, Chuck, man, I've lost 15 pounds in five weeks. Man, I haven't had a cigarette in two months. But, you know, since I started listening to your binaural beat recordings, since I started going to sessions with you, I've never slept better than I have in my whole life since I was young. So I started getting more and more people that had insomnia challenges and now I have an offshoot of lightning hypnosis that I call the sleep optimizer. And I have sleep coaching clients that are retired school teachers to Muay Thai MMA fighters, you know, um, and I help them die on their sleep because have you ever found when you don't get enough sleep, the world seems less tolerable? People yep. seem <laughs> to get on your nerves more. So if I dial in your sleep, your other challenges don't seem as big. So I do that. So I'm a weather geek. I'm a mind geek. And then I'm an occasional actor. And I just came out in Immortal, Joe Lujan's Immortal Wars, Rebirth, Eric Roberts and Tom mm -hmm. Sizemore were in the first one. Eric was in the second one. This one, my voice was in the second one as a news anchor. And in this one, I actually make it on screen. I'm nice. a, and I made the credits. So it says all the actors' names. Then it says, and Chuck DeBroder. So occasionally I'm an actor. As nice. Well. Nice. So I have some, that is, that is awesome that we learned so much about you already. But I have some more questions to kind of dive okay, in. Okay, sure. Dive in a little bit more. So. Tell us the, your favorite place that you ever lived. You mentioned a few places, Colorado and Texas and, and so on. What is the favorite place that you've ever lived? Well, it would be in different categories. But overall, I would have to say El Paso, Texas, where I live right now, because I have the culture of Mexico and the best mm. Mexican food on the planet. And I have a wife who's a pastry chef 
a professional mm. chef and I'm wow. from Mexico. So I've got all that going on. And um, I used my own hypnosis to lose. I'm 60 pounds lighter than I was four years ago. Wow. But, uh, uh, that was all from the stress of entertainment industry as well. We'll get into that. But, you know, I'm at the end of the Rocky Mountains in El Paso. There's a mountain that divides the city. So I'm at the western slope of the mountain. Now there's no pine trees on it. It's a desert mountain. Mm -hmm. There's cacti mm -hmm. and plenty of desert plants, which are beautiful in their own right. And then I can go up, you know, an hour up the road and see mountains, the Sacramento's. I can go into the big bend where all the Hollywood producers and now Jeff Bezos has a house where he uh, launched successfully into space from Fort Hancock is only mm -hmm. an hour and a half. And then uh, hour up the road a little bit, we have Spaceport America and Elon Musk and, and Richard Branson going into space. So now people are discovering El Paso. So my home value has gone up 125,000 in two years. Can you nice. believe that? Nice. But, I can. Uh, it's still inexpensive. But overall, where I was born, Denver, has got a special place in my heart. It's changed immensely. I call it the marijuanification <laughs> of Colorado. Mm -hmm. But it is so expensive to live, but it's still so beautiful. And and I miss that. So, so me and my wife have been to Texas, and we are now spoiled on Mexican food. Because you go pretty much anywhere else in the United States. I, I don't like California Mexican. Been out there, too. Didn't like it. Mm -mm. Um, and I live in South Carolina, so the Mexican here is like I call it Americanified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the, that they that is the best Mexican food is in Texas, and and then the rest of Texas we're uh, not sn snobbish, but we know we have the best because we're sister cities with a city of two and a half million, Ciudad Juarez. Which, by the way, if you're not in the drug game, it's not as dangerous as what they've portrayed over mm -hmm. the years in the media. They don't care about you. Um, it's actually much safer than most mid and large American cities, mm -hmm. crime-wise. El Paso, Texas has been the safest city in America for the last 10 years or more. Um, and we're right here. But anyway, we're located right next to Mexico. And in the other part of Texas, they like to throw sopa, rice, into everything. And the rice should be on the side, not inside your burrito. But anyway, they, they <laughs> Tex-Mex it over there. Mm -hmm. And over here is definitely the best. So. Nice. Um, I, I could talk about, about Denver and Boulder area, too, but I, I'm not going to. I love that area as well. Oh. Um, but I'm going to go on with the questions because we could talk sure. about that for a while. We'll get off the phone. We'll, we'll have a, just a regular conversation. About it. Yeah. yeah. I, I noticed um, on your Facebook feed the other day, you did a video uh, and talked about John Wooden. Are uh -huh. you a sports fan? And if you are, what's your favorite sport? Wow. Well, basketball is important in the playoffs, right? Mm -hmm. And in the, in the NCAA tournament, and all that. I like when people go all out in any sport I'm watching, mm -hmm. when they leave it all on the floor. And that should be a metaphor for life. And John Wooden saw that he played basketball and then he coached and was arguably probably the best college basketball coach of all time. And he knew how to motivate people and he knew personality types, and that's where my mind geek comes in. Lou Holtz also was of the same ilk. He was a player. He was a he loved the sport. So the best coaches usually are former players or just somebody that has such a passion for the sport. I grew up, my parents put me in all Denver Bronco gear, shoulder <laughs> pads, helmet, everything since the age of like three or five, the neighborhood kids would say, Mrs. DeBroder, it's okay at the age of five, six, seven, if he comes out and plays with the big kids because he's in full pads. <laughs> now, nowadays, parents probably wouldn't do that. And it may account for some of my brain damage <laughs> that I, <laughs> I received. They would use little Chuck as the ball. But I'll tell you one thing. 
I learned back at five years old, I would watch and learn. So then when geeky Chuck in high school was the last one picked for flag football and was wide open, he would catch the ball and score a touchdown. And I'll tell you, (laughs) after two or three times of that, he was never wide open again. (laughs) He was well covered because people were like, damn, he really (laughs) knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So I love football, but I played, uh, as they call it in the rest of the world, I played soccer growing up. I was, um, they called me kamikaze Chuck because I would (laughs) sacrifice my whole body as a fullback and slide tackle and legally trip people with the ball and everything. I was a little vicious little geek, um, always skinny, but I had many a goalie buy me lunch because I saved the game. I saved the goal by slide tackling and sacrificing myself uh, in lieu of the goal, you know. Um, an, an easy goal is um, worse than somebody getting a penalty kick or um, a corner kick, right? Mm-hmm. So, yep. anyway, so soccer I love as well. Um, but the best sport is learning. <laughs> and I, I think that is a sport we should never stop. Right. I will never use the word retire in my vernacular. No one should ever retire. Right, right. I, 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 I'm in total agreement with that. Um, I, just, I love learning. <laughs> I don't know how anyone could, could stop. Like it, it doesn't, doesn't compute up here. Like why would I want to stop? <laughs> so Yeah, I gave you a couple of books and I'll give them to your viewers. Uh, I, I'm rereading for the 80th time. Robert Collier, The Secret of the Ages. Um, Wallace Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich. And there's little things in there that stick in your subconscious. And all of a sudden, your brain has a funny thing of popping things out that you read. And um, I always say, the average American reads one to two books a year. Can you imagine if you read one to two a month? Mm -hmm. Your friends, your relatives, your neighbors would say, gee, I didn't realize Chuck was that intelligent. Hmm. How do you get that way? It's from reading and it's from reading old school books. I'm going to reach over, you know, and grab a few. And I've always, you know, just like Bob Proctor, always have a copy of Think and Go Rich, mm-hmm. the Psycho Cybernetics, which was a benefit of a coaching class we were in. And uh, there we go. And I've got to plug Eric Reinholdt's book, a friend of mine, a former weather guy, A Trip of a Lifetime, mm. about the first hotel built on the moon. Oh, wow. And, and, and it's sci-fi. But yeah, Trip of a Lifetime. Nice. And, uh, but anyway, I've got them all right here. And you know what? I got 10 minutes in between a call. I'll pick up a book and start reading. And mm-hmm. I like holding the book. You know, I can kindle mm-hmm. it, I'm- but yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. I need, I need the physical copy. I need to be able to turn the page and feel mm-hmm. the page turn um, and put the bookmark in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm exactly the same way. So another thing that I know about you is, is just based on following you a little bit online is that you are a Star Wars fan. Um, oh, yeah. I've seen you with a Star Wars shirt. And <laughs> there, there was something else where, that was related to Star Wars that makes you think, oh, yeah, he's a Star Wars fan. I'm a Star Wars fan as well. Um, from my childhood, it was like yeah. my favorite movie growing up. So I just wonder: is do you have a favorite movie in the in that series, or and do you have a favorite character? Wow, I when I was younger didn't realize the value of the knowledge of Yoda <laughs> and what he says, and. We use the word in hypnosis, try, when we want people to not do something. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thrown a party and somebody says, oh, hey, Doug, great. I'll try and make it. (laughs) Are they going to make it? More than likely, no. No. And Yoda had a saying. What did he say in his Yoda ease in his language? Do not try. No, try not do. I don't know. It goes one of those ways. (laughs) Yeah. Because um, 
And another guy who was a motivator, uh, James Arthur Ray, who was on The Secret, he had a little mishap in Sedona, Arizona. And, uh, but he was, I saw him in person. He was trying to get me to go to a $3,000 weekend with him. But he, some lady stood up and said, oh, I'm going to, he says, anybody have a goal? And she says, yeah, I'm going to try and open a restaurant. He goes, you never will. Right. And the, and the lady started getting angry. She goes, no, I'm going to try here in the next few months. He goes, no, it'll never happen. He says, try is to fail with honor. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, gee. So anyway, Yoda, because of little sayings like that. Um, Darth Maul, because mm-hmm. I had a graphic artist paint me up as Darth Maul from the poster before anybody had even seen the movie. And we didn't even know he had horns. So I wore the hood and she painted me red and black and I got yellow contacts. And I did the weather from the premiere of the movie dressed as Darth Maul and talk about, uh, you know, weather geeks from uh, (laughs) Passer, Star Wars geeks geeking out. Mm-hmm. and taking pictures and this is and she did the makeup driving 80 miles an hour in a van because we were late to the live shot she finished it up and touched it up and it was amazing wow. and i don't even know if there's any pictures around or whatever but uh i just have a special place just because i played him you know? if if you find that picture post it in the in the comments okay. <laughs> after the video i will <laughs> yeah that, i will that'd be awesome but, yeah, I have a lot of pictures. Mandalorian, I have some. Uh, I like, you know, you know, because it's a Star Wars product, mm-hmm. and the Disney, you know, they have to make some of the money they paid for the franchise back. So, mm-hmm. you know, and they have, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll just put it that just, way. Just from Baby Yoda. <laughs> oh yeah, Baby Yoda, just from that. <laughs> yep. You know, and you know what? I don't dislike Baby Yoda. It's it's fine, you know. Now, um, did you like uh, the animated character that they tried to put in there? I don't know. I liked when Jim Henson kind of got involved, mm-hmm. but um, you know, I'm old school Muppet fan as well. So. Yeah, me too. We're, we're I think we're the same age demographic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I believe we are. But we're still mentally we're men, so mentally we're always 21, 22. That's right. That's Maybe. right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife wish I was more my age. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If, if my wife was listening right now, she'd say you were 12. Maybe. <laughs> so. All right. So, so now let's get into some questions just about your entrepreneur journey in general. Sure. How did you get into hypnotherapy? Oh, well, let's go. How did you go from meteorology to hypnotherapy? I think you might've touched on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. Well, you know, I did both at the same time. But now I have the time to do more of the hypnotherapy. I'm still doing weather geek numbers old style. I don't know if you can see that, but I have the days of the Mm -hmm. week and I have Las Cruces and Sudad Juarez. And I like a pen and a notepad because it goes from your eyes to your brain, down your arm to your hand to the page. And it sticks in my mind. So I can roll off the next week's worth of highs and lows because I wrote it down. And that's what we all need to do in our lives. You know, and I tell, I'm going to give you some free gold, but I write the top 10 gratitude list uh, goals down all the time. And I read them before I go to bed. And when I wake up the 10 things I'm grateful for, and number one's my health. And then I write three goals for the day down. Just three, because your mind gets overwhelmed with Mm -hmm. more than three things. Mm -hmm. So I do that. But anyway, going back to the question. um, Yeah, I just I love watching people change and realizing your change is not as difficult as what we make it in our fantasy world or mind. Mm -hmm. Your change is a choice. It's a decision. And that goes with entrepreneurial. journey Mm -hmm. make a choice make a decision 
and just take imperfect action. Just take action today. You know, don't try. Do don't try, <laughs> and don't say, "Oh, I'm," uh, you know, working on that. Yeah. Well, okay, work on it in the way of just writing an outline, yeah. mm-hmm. and then just doing it. Yeah. Like right now, I've been putting off a Facebook group, and you know what? I finally just made the Sleep Optimizer Mastermind. I may change the group name. But I just made a group and it was not as hard as what my mind made it out to be. Now, is it completely done? No. Is my coaching program completely finished? It should never be finished. Right. You should always add to it. So anyway, that's my preaching. That that is awesome. Um, So another thing I noticed uh, from your Facebook profile the other day is you did a a video about inspiration. And um, I want to know what inspires you. Um, inspiration. What inspires me is seeing people succeed after hard work. When someone says they were an overnight success, yeah, it was 29, <laughs> 20 years of overnight, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that inspires me because we all think, oh, it's going to be too much work. Did you know I love animals? I buy, my wife and I buy 280 pounds of chicken scratch a month for the wild birds in wow. our backyard, just in our backyard. So wow. birds from around the nation say, hey, if you're ever traveling through El Paso, <laughs> stop by this restaurant here, the De Broders. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to become a vet, but I said, who wants to spend eight years in college? Well, guess what? The universe put me eight years in college getting two degrees. And I could have gone into the veterinarian degree. But um, the universe, God, Buddha, whatever you believe, had a different plan for me, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't regret not being a vet. I can still enjoy animals. And, uh, you know, uh, I have a love... uh, of nature and animals that inspires me. I'm getting back to that. Um, I just, the finding out about our inner universe, our mind, learning new things about the mind really inspires me. I learn new things about the weather. You know, I get geeked out about a thunderstorm. Last night, we probably had three inches of rain here at our house. Did you know we only get 8.76 8.76 inches of rain a year here wow, in El Paso. Wow. We're the driest city in Texas, but we've already received, um, as of yesterday, 8.35. As of this morning, I haven't checked, but we're almost to our yearly average so far this year. Wow. And we've gotten all that in the last two months. And so um, I, I really get especially geeked out because there's a lot of sunny days here. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's wild to think, you know, I never think of rain because I'm, I'm assuming El Paso is pretty much a desert. So I never think yeah. of rain in the desert. And anytime something like that would happen, I would be like, oh, my gosh, let me check this out. It's kind of like snow in Florida, right? Yeah. <laughs> or even snow here. People go nuts. And I'm from Denver. So I had to change my definition on TV as snow because. 37 snowflakes on your car windshield, it snowed in El Paso. <laughs> but in Denver, we wouldn't even say it snowed. Oh, right. yeah, there were a couple snowflakes. <laughs> but, you know, they call that snowing. Mm-hmm. And when it snows here, it may snow a half inch, inch, two inches, but it's most of the time melted by noon, you know. So, and we'll get three days of snow a year, maybe here, mm-hmm. usually two. Uh, a a winter. So, yeah. Um, Another question is, let me think about this one. Um, What I I know you're very good at video. Now, was it easy transition from being on TV, a weatherman to doing more stuff online for, for video? You know, I made the mistake of not just keeping it going. I was, went into my self-pity mode of, you know, oh, this is all I know how to do. No, it's not. (laughs) 
you know, when you're in that box of TV, you can't see outside the box. And that goes for all of us. You're not just one dimensional, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, I didn't go and do videos for a while. So when I did do videos, I had hundreds of people watching because they hadn't seen me in a while. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to do a little bit more. And then there's Facebook algorithms now too. If people don't comment, show you love, it's not going to be shared. If you don't give the Facebook mafia some uh, money, you know, uh, and pay for some ads, you know, they like you more if mm -hmm. you pay them just like <laughs> mm -hmm. anybody. Yeah. So um, I've learned, but uh, we do the live streaming that's simultaneous on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook every weekday, Monday through Friday at 630 on weather. It's an hour newscast. So I'm, I'm getting that to do that. My wife produces it. I give her half my money and it's, it's still not enough. But, uh, <laughs> I know that feeling too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it really did help me. But I noticed when I didn't do it for a few months, I had to get back into the swing and, and think about, gee, what was it that made me entertaining back when I was on TV? And it was being myself, but you got to, boost up a few things you gotta have some vocal variety you have to say a few things that make people do a double take you know and now with the five second or less rule of attention span you gotta catch their mm -hmm. attention and i've gone on tiktok and i'm doing quotes from people right now and i'm kind of getting my tiktok feet so if there's anybody out there that's a tiktok expert let me know and uh you know um i see a lot of the good videos but a lot of people spend a lot of time editing those tiktoks mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and i've just learned how to make the text fade on and off and, and nice there you go nice i have not uh ventured as far as personally onto onto tiktok i'm trying to stay focused on, on just a couple platforms. So mm -hmm. um, I will eventually check that out because it is a, a great And I'm bringing job. Snapchat back. And from what I know, the Snapchat loyal fan base is still there. Nice. And I saw a Snapchat ad for you to advertise on Snapchat on Facebook Oh, this past week. So mm. nice. Uh, so. To kind of transition from, from what you were talking about from... Um, being able to be good on camera. Um, can you give the audience just some tips? Because uh, a lot of people struggle with video, right? To, to just be comfortable. Just be yourself. And, you know, your mind goes or your energy flows where your attention goes. So don't worry about mistakes. That's the first thing I would coach people on TV because we started hiring people on the cheap um, even minimum wage here in market 82, largest market in El Paso, they're, they're hiring cheap. But people would make a mistake and say, excuse me, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> you should never be sorry about mistakes. You're human. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, one day I said, Idaho, Idaho, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. on the air, you know, you just keep going. It's when you stop and bring attention to your mistake that's when people feel sorry for you and they change the channel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they tune out. So if you make a mistake, just say, hey, I'm, I'm getting my mouth working. What I want to say is, or you say the word rather. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite one. Mm -hmm. It's quick. It's one word. You know, Idaho, rather Idaho mm -hmm. saw five inches of rain the other day and people move on with yeah. their mind. Um, also, think about your three main points you want to touch on and just use filler in between. And when you have exasperated all your knowledge about the first thing, move on to the second. And I learned that in speech class. I used to write my speeches two minutes, five minutes before I went up and gave them. And I never got below an A minus in speech class. Because I use this rule. You tell the people 
the three things you're going to tell them about in the intro. Then you tell them about each of the three things. And then you remind the people in the conclusion, the three things you told them about. So if you keep that rule of three in your Facebook lives, in your videos, it will help you immensely stay on point. And again, do not worry about mistakes. And I just use something that some people say, oh, don't ever use. Um, I'll use an example that was poor from my TV station. They'd say it's ratings on a little cardboard sign on the studio door. Don't screw up. <laughs> well, do you know what your subconscious mind hears is screw up? Mm -hmm. So then a lot of people's attention goes to screwing up. And so when they do screw up minorly, it turns into a bigger screw up. So again, focus on what you do right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you should do that in your work, in your business, in your life. Keep improving what is the best about you. And all the other stuff will fall into place. Nice. You know? Nice. I have a, let's go back to sleep. Um, how you help people with sleep. Sure. Um, what is the most, why is it so beneficial for an entrepreneur specifically to get their sleep patterns dialed in? Yeah, it is so important. Um, you know, people are like, Oh, in order to be a successful entrepreneur, I need to get up at 5 AM every morning. Well, Okay, if you need to do that, then you need to go to bed before 9 p.m. at night. And then before you go into the massive entrepreneur workload, you need to dial in the consistency of going to sleep at 9 and waking up at 5. Now, you can be a successful entrepreneur going to bed at 11 and waking up at seven, okay. And eight hours is really a good target for your sleep. But how much of that eight hour sleep is actually high quality sleep? Mm. If, and you know what? I used to go out after work and have a couple beers and I was a social drinker. And I know my buddies in the UK, they go to the pub four or five days a week, you know? after work well did you know alcohol marijuana and sleeping pills are in a sedative group and when you take sedatives they do not allow you to drop into stage four which is the deepest stage of sleep and they do not allow you to go into REM stage which you initially do in the first level of hypnosis which is the alpha stage of sleep. If you've ever watched somebody sleep or if they've been hypnotized, you see their eyeball moving around underneath their eyelid, mm -hmm. they're in REM stage sleep. Alcohol and marijuana, even though they may knock you out, they don't allow you to stay in that stage of sleep. And alcohol actually awakens you multiple times a night where you're not even aware in little micro awakenings, which keep you from dropping into the most reparative and beneficial stage of sleep as well. Well, I did not know that, you know, my, I would have just thought, you know, drink some alcohol and sleep better or, or, you know, I, I never smoked marijuana, but I imagine that, yeah. you know, smoke some and, and, and oh, it, it'll make you pass out. Yeah. But it's not the quality of sleep that you want to get at night. And people say, how about CBD oil? Well, the research isn't long enough for that. But um, I would say it's better than the THC. Um, but still, if you can do some things like up the morning light in the morning, get five to 10 minutes of sunlight to get that serotonin boosting in the morning that tells your brain it's like a reset or a reboot button for your brain 
And of course you wanna put on sunblock and you want the early morning sun, not the damaging sun. But if you can get natural light in the morning, that helps you sleep better at night. And I have seven tricks to help you get better sleep tonight. And I can send your uh, viewers the link of the we'll, video. We'll put, it, we'll, put it on, we'll put it in the comments below. Okay, we'll put it in the comments. And I'll tell you what to do. But in my sleep coaching, I tell you how to do it and how it fits you personally. Because some people have no trouble falling asleep, but they have a trouble staying asleep. Mm. or they're awakened in the middle of the night and then they cannot go back to sleep. Um, others invent their fantasy world so vividly that they cannot shut off their mind. And so I have a trick that uses this right here. 50 cents at Walmart right now because they're going back to school, but just a composition book. Write everything in your mind before you go to sleep down into a journal. And I call it a mind dump, right? Where you clear your mind and it helps out there. Now I'll tell you how to do it when we talk a little bit more. But um, yeah, I'm now through my sleep coaching, I've got an outline to a book that I'm, I'm writing. And then I'm also doing a couple other things. I do have a binaural beat professional recording for sleep, weight loss, stop smoking, and then complete mind therapy, which encompasses everything, which also puts you to sleep while you listen to that. And I'm now building a funnel, which I know you're an expert on. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a funnel. And after I paid for coaching, I couldn't afford top funnel builders. So I have an 18 year old in New Delhi that's taken months, mm. but I'm gonna get there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, one of the options is, is my sleep recordings. And, uh, but um, yeah, uh, write me about that. We'll hop on a call and we'll, we'll work out a special Doug Greathouse <laughs> deal there. Nice, right. nice. Um, I, I can attest to, to the sleep thing because um, and I'm sure most of the entrepreneur audience can, like, if you ever, like what, how productive is your day when you've gotten not, not efficient sleep, right. And versus the day that you've just slept and you wake up energized and, and ready to go. Um, so it is pivotal in my mind. Uh, and you helping people with that is, is amazing. And I've got a Starbucks card. Don't get me wrong. And, um, but did you know, it takes eight hours for the effects of caffeine to wear off your body and it takes 12 hours for your coffee to get completely out of your system so if you have an afternoon cup of coffee don't expect to really drop into deeper high quality sleep for another eight hours so you really have to watch that as well uh it's, it's just funny that you bring that up because it wasn't but just a few days ago, I, I usually never have coffee after 2 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. because, because I realized that. And I had a cup of coffee at 4 o'clock. And it totally rest up, messed up my sleep patterns for, for days mm -hmm. um, because I had to get back on my cycle. So, um, Yeah, and, and that consistent sleep pattern. Now, on the weekend, you, you may have a late show you're going to. You're going out for a night out with friends. Uh, and you're going to get to bed later. Um, you'll feel the impact. Usually it's two days later. It's not really the next day, but as long as the next night you go to sleep, you go to bed at nine, your body's like, oh yeah, okay. He's back in that pattern. Even if you're in bed and some people say, oh, you need to get rid of all blue light. You shouldn't watch TV from bed. You shouldn't watch your phone. You can watch TV and your phone but just gradually turn down the room lighting of your room as a signal to your brain to start producing melatonin. And did you know your stomach and other organs produce melatonin in your body naturally as well? I did not know that. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah, that, that is cool. Yeah. Um, so 
It has been wonderful having you on today. Um, let everyone know once again how to reach out to you um, and kind of uh, what how you can help them. Well, um, lightning hypnosis at Gmail. Um, I can put a Calendly link if you want, if you do that as well. Um, I have a few websites all being built, but I have lightning hypnosis at now site dot something. God, I don't even we'll, dot we'll, net. We'll, we'll, we'll put that I'll link. put it all in there, yeah. but I have one where you can get the link to the video, uh, the sleep optimizer video. Um, and just look me up on all social media. Even if you find my weather geek stuff where, gosh, I have 70,000 followers on Facebook, 330,000 on YouTube now. Um, and you can even learn recipes or my wife makes the world of Lex cartoon where you learn about weather mm. and its impact on you. And he's got little kid friends, but you learn about fog yesterday we taught about. But anyway, nice. so we do that. So just look up Chuck de Broder. Uh, it's Danish originally means Chuck de Bruder, the original Germanic language, which means Chuck the brother. Mm. So I'm the brother to all. There you go. <laughs> nice. But uh, D E B R O D E R. Just look me up. And I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you know, Snapchat, TikTok, all over. Well, we will put multiple links below the video so you'll have multiple ways to Thank reach you. out to uh chuck and he can help you um if you if you have problems getting over smoking if you have trouble sleeping if a uh, multitude of things weight loss as you mentioned um just mindset things um chuck's your guy <laughs> yeah long distance running to fighting i'm helping wow uh, muay thai fighters right now and Guess what? The first thing I do is I help them sleep because mm. as an athlete, you have your sleep dialed in. You're so much more focused on your game. And, and we we need to take that into our entrepreneurial and our everyday life, too, yeah. with with everything, health, wealth and relationships. Totally, totally agree. Thank, thank you again, Chuck. Thank you. Appreciate it, Doug. And let's talk about Colorado off the phone. Yes. <laughs> we'll talk some more. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.